Let me ask you a question. Have you ever been called out? Usually, to be honest, nothing thrills our heart more, does it, than somebody calling us out. Especially when we didn't ask for it. I knew that this was going to happen to me on our sabbatical. And boy, did it ever. God called me out on some things. But you think about the fact that usually we don't like to be called out by anybody. And God has done this over and over. And as much as I love you, I just didn't want you to miss out on the blessing. So I'm going to call everybody out today. All right? So I wanted you to get in on the game. But I'm not calling you out for the bad. It's going to be a great thing. And when you think about this, every person who steps into greatness has been called out by somebody. In other words, they have allowed somebody to call them out. People who don't allow themselves to be called out by anybody, they live a life of arrogance, and the only greatness they know is their own agenda. So if we're going to step into greatness, we have got to allow people to call us out. That is exactly what God wants to do on this day. I'm not talking about for next week. I'm not talking about... Uh, thinking about I'm going to, I'll allow God to call me out for greatness next week or next month or next year. I'm talking about this day on March 24th that you will allow today, on this day, <coughs> to allow God to call you out for something that you maybe don't even understand. Maybe it's a thing today that you've grown dormant in your spiritual life, that you are living the life of just in the area of familiar, because that's usually where we live. We don't ever live in the greatness of what God wants. We usually just live in the familiar, and I'm convinced that the reason that most people never are called out for greatness is because most of the time, we don't see other Christ followers who've ever decided, I want God to use me for greatness. If you got your Bibles, turn to John chapter 1 with me. We're going to be there. We're going to camp out there, but in John chapter 1 is that Jesus is going public with his ministry. We really don't know a whole lot about the first 30 years of Jesus' life. We know a few things, but not a lot. But here he's going public with his ministry, and the first item of business for him is to pick his disciples. These are the men that he is going to entrust the future of humanity to. So John chapter 1, starting with verse 43, would you stand with me as we read in reverence to God's word on this day. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me, Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus said, you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. He then added, very truly I tell you. You will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Pray with me. God, I pray that we laugh today. I pray, God, that we allow you to look at areas of our heart that we've tried to hide from you, that keep us from the greatness that you have for us. And God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be found acceptable in your strength. O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. In Jesus' name that we pray, and everybody says, amen. God bless you. Thank you for standing with me. So Christ is pulling together this group of disciples, and he looks at Philip, and he just simply has one statement. Follow me. That's all he says is follow me. He doesn't tell him where he's going. He doesn't tell him what the results are going to be. He simply says, follow me. Now, follow me means that you're going to allow someone to lead you. And as they lead you, you're probably going to monitor their behavior. And we allow, we allow that person to really determine the direction of our life if we're allowing them to lead us. Jesus finds Philip. Philip immediately goes and finds Nathaniel. Look what he tells him in verse 44. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathaniel and told him, 
we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law. Now understand, at this point, all that Philip has done is that he has read the prophecies of the Old Testament. He's read the law by Moses. And so he knows that there's a person by the name of Jesus coming. He understands that. But here's what's taking place. No more is it just a make-believe thing. No more is it something that he's hoping it's going to happen. This dude is standing right in front of him, Jesus the Messiah. And then he says on, he says, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth. And it's almost like he says, you know, the son of Joseph. And so Philip sees this miracle right in front of him. And then he goes and tells Nathaniel. I want you to understand today, we all need to understand, if we are desiring a movement of God and we're desiring the greatness of God in our life, we need to understand that it's always determined by relationships. So here's the first point. The first element of being called out is determined by relationships. This relationship that you have with Jesus through the Holy Spirit, it should affect every earthly relationship that you have. Now, when we have this relationship with the Holy Spirit, you think about this. So many of you, teenagers and adults alike, you are praying at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. The only reason that the greatness is used in your life and God is doing great things in your life is because even though you don't know it, God is using greatness in your life because you're praying at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. I'm convinced the reason you have over 600 at Atoma is because people are praying at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. And the reason that so many other things have happened, there are events that take place that you know nothing about, that is simply because of the relationship that you have with the Spirit of God and that you are praying at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. And I will tell you that we saw this fleshed out on our sabbatical all the time. Uh, the first thing that we did was that we went to Denver, Colorado. We're at a place called Quiet Water Ministries. All they do is deal with pastors and their spouse. It's about renewal. It's about making sure that you make it to the end. And boy, I'm telling you, it was a good thing we went because my wife needed all that counseling really bad. So thank you for praying for her. But they kept telling us, it's, they called it an intensive counseling. Well, I didn't have any idea what intensive counseling meant. By the second day, I understood why they used the word intensive. That joker got in my business and stayed in my business. I mean, it was crazy. But we just saw how God was using because I, so many of you I knew were praying for us. But we left there. We, we flew to Los Angeles. We spent four days with our son in Los Angeles. We got there, and we're going somewhere, and we're with a Lyft driver. And it's Shara and Isaac and myself. I don't know where we're going, but we were going somewhere, and there was the Lyft driver. And as soon as we get in, this Lyft driver just begins to talk. He talks and talks and talks and talks. Nobody ever says anything. We all just listen. And all of a sudden, at 7 o'clock in Los Angeles, my alarm goes off of my watch. And I said, hey, can I, can I interrupt you a second? He said, yeah. I said, I pastor a church outside of Nashville, Tennessee. And I said, we do something, our people do something every day at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. And we pray for revival. So I said, do you mind if I just, just take right now and can I just pray for our church and for revival? And, and matter of fact, can I pray for you as well? And he looked at me and he goes, oh, hell yeah, you can pray for me. <laughs> and I looked at him and I wanted to say, do you, do you go to the Bridge Fellowship? <laughs> but, you know, I just saw all these ministry opportunities. I, I might have even walked by that opportunity and never had seen it. Be, people were praying, and this supernatural thing happens because you don't know it, but God is calling out the greatness of your life because of the relationship that you have with the Spirit of God. I, I saw this whole thing about how God uses relationships in our lives. Is that uh, at the end of my sabbatical, I was at the John Maxwell Leadership Conference. And that was in Orlando. And um, it's the first time I'd ever been to it. There was over 3,000 people there. And so as I was at that conference, they began to tell this story about this lady that came last year. Her name is Maria. Maria is from Bangladesh. And her whole goal was that she wanted to rescue teenage girls because usually in Bangladesh, by the time that they're 16 and 17 years old, they have three to four kids. And so she wanted to rescue them out of that, and she wanted to be able to, um, 
to get them an education. And so they, last year she told this whole story about how she went into debt, thousands upon thousands of dollars. And they said that when she was talking, nobody even asked, but people just started just coming to the stage and throwing money at her just to alleviate, help her alleviate some of the debt. Well, this year she shows back up. She comes back, but this year she doesn't come by herself. She brings a 20-year-old girl that looks like she's a, maybe 15. Her name is Shuli. She brings Shuli, and Shuli was one of the girls that were rescued. And not only has she graduated from high school, but now, along with 17 other girls, this same lady has put Shuli and 17 other girls through college as well. Not only did she put them through college, but she took all of their family members who'd never had really a job, taught them how to dress, how to clean up, how to do job interviews, and she got all their parents hired by the airline industry. And when she tells that story, and all of a sudden, they bring Shuley on the stage, and when Shuley comes on the stage, I mean, she's 20, and she, John Maxwell says, well, Shuley, you know, you're on the John Maxwell team now. What's your plans when you get out of college? And she said, oh, I know what I'm doing now when I get out of college. Well, what is it? She said, I'm going to be involved in politics, and then when I'm 34, I'll be the prime minister of Bangladesh. Grown men and women, we were standing on our chairs crying and applauding for this 20-year-old girl to have this kind of vision. And at the end of the day on Sunday, John Maxwell, you understand, this is not a spiritual event. This is a leadership conference. There's people from every walks of life, from all these foreign countries that are there just wanting to be greater leaders. And on Sunday, he says to 3,000 people, he says, now, I want to tell you something. We're having a worship service in the morning. Most of you would have never made it because it was at 730. You would have never come there, all right? He said, but I'm going to help you. I'm going to help you a lot, but I need you to come. To show you the influence he has, it was probably, they said there was over 2,600 people that came to the worship service on a voluntary basis. They show up. John Maxwell preaches a sermon on the Good Samaritan. And at the end of the service, he does what we do here just about every week. He says, if you want this relationship with Jesus and you want to become a Jesus follower, he said, I'm going to ask that you pray this prayer with me. They pray a prayer. He says, now, if you prayed that prayer, I want you to just stand up. Stand up right now. And boy, you hear the chairs. And all of a sudden, you look around, and there's people standing everywhere. And he says, now, I want you to come forward. Just come forward. You would thought that you were at a Billy Graham crusade because over 1,000 people came forward to give their life to Christ. <clears throat> And all of a sudden, he looks down, and nobody knows who he's talking to because there's so many people. And he says, hey, hey, you two, you two guys, get that girl up on stage with me. Just, just, just pick, her up and, pick her up and put her on, right now, just pick her up and put her on stage. So they do. And all of a sudden, turns around, is Shuli from Bangladesh. And he said, Shuli, I know you're part of John Maxwell team, but can you tell me, sweetheart, what's happened to you today? And she said... I really wasn't expecting this, but today I saw that Jesus was the only way, and I became a follower of Jesus today. And John Maxwell looked at everybody and it says, and when she's 34 and she's in Bangladesh where 90% of the people are Islamic, and she stands up and she's a prime minister at 34 and she's a Christ follower, you can say, I was in the room when it happened. I'm going to tell you. There's some of you here today that God's going to do such an incredible work in your life that you're just going to say, God, I want, to, I want you to use me for greatness. Whatever that means, use me for greatness. And you're going to be able to see that when Easter Sunday morning comes and all of a sudden next year things begin to happen that we never had, didn't have any idea, it's because on March the 24th there were some people in the church that decided, I'm going to allow God to use me for greatness and the way that God's going to use me for greatness is whatever he wants to use me with. And I will be able to say when I see the movement of God, that on March 24th, I was in the room where I decided for God to call me out for greatness. We see that relationships are a must. But you know, when we, we think about these, these relationships that we have, is that we always see in Scripture where someone was called out for greatness, and, and when they're called out for greatness, 
we see it even on a deeper scale here in verse 46. It says, he says, Nazareth, can anything, he says, Nazareth, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Now, Nazareth, why, why Nazareth? Why, why is that such a big deal? Because, you see, Nazareth was known for two things, for being a military town and being a town that just had a lot of prostitution because of the military town. And he's going, Nazareth? Why in the world Nazareth? Why did Jesus not come from Rome or Jerusalem? Why did he come from Nazareth? And you see, he came out of Nazareth. He came from the worst place. He came from the place that God predicted to show us that God will show up in the worst places of your life to call you out of greatness. And there's some of you here today, and you're thinking there's no way that God can use me for greatness because you are struggling with a sin that's so big in your life, or even if you think you've dealt with it, it continues to linger on. You know, it's just sort of hanging around. You can't get rid of it. You can't have victory over it. And God's saying, I want you just to make sure and know Notice that on this day, I want to use you for greatness, and because I'm going to use you for greatness, is that when this sin, and I'm going to deal with it in your life, I need you to understand that I love you so much that I want to use you for greatness. He will show up in the worst places of your life to still use you for greatness. He comes from Nazareth, the worst place. And today, you know, you might be saying, you know what, I, I really don't need God. I mean, because I don't need God, because, you know, I've got... Maybe you're too prideful that you're too smart for God or you have too much. Why do I even need God? I've got so much money. I don't need God. Maybe your arrogance today is that you have too little. How in the world could God ever use me? I mean, I don't even have anything to give to him. Whatever is the proudest thing in your life, God wants to use that in your life and to say to you, I want to call you out for greatness. But what we think is, is that we have this kind of stigma. That God can't use me for greatness until I get all my stuff together. That's the reason for greatness. That God wants to call you out for greatness even in the middle of all of your stuff. You see, I think what we forget a lot of times is that God does this, first of all, through the Holy Spirit. But second of all, he always does this through other people. And you look how God, all through, all through Scripture, God used other people to call other people out. And here, he used Philip to call Nathaniel out. And so many times, we miss God's greatness. Don't miss this. Please don't miss this. We miss God's greatness because the people that know us best, we don't allow them to call us out for anything much less greatness. Those people in your life that you think the people that know you best, that love Jesus, what would happen in your life if you would simply just say, if you'd go to those people, I know you love me, I know you love Jesus, so this is what I'm going to ask you to do. Whatever is my life, I need you to call that out. And you know what you're going to see? You're going to start seeing more people will say, more people will, will be agreeing with that. It's going to be agreeing in the spirit. They're going to be agreeing with that, but most time we don't want anybody to call us out because we want to live by our own agenda rather than God's greatness. You see, because God's, God's greatness is never the familiar. That's where we want to use, that's where we usually want to live is in the familiar. Man, I, I saw this when, I guess it was the first or second day when we started our sabbatical. I'm in, I'm in, the, um, I'm in the dining room. I'm having my breakfast. I'm drinking my cup of coffee. And Cher walks through. And when she walks through, I just simply say, do you have something you need to tell me? I don't think so. Why? She said, oh, brother, you've had one of those crazy dreams again, hadn't you? I said, no, listen. It was so vivid. I need to tell you about it. She goes, oh, brother. She goes, you're crazy. No, listen to me. I said, I dreamed that there was a church in Dallas, Texas that called me and wanted me to come be the pastor. We were praying through it, and you had decided, being from Dallas, you had decided that it was time for us to move to Dallas. And when I came home from church, there wasn't a for sale sign. There was a sold sign in our front yard. I said, is there something that you need to tell me? She goes, yeah, there is. She said, I love my house. I love where I live. I love the church we go to, and I ain't moving to Dallas, Texas. I said, are you sure? And she just rolled her eyes and just walked on. The whole day she would be sitting next to me in the car or somewhere, and I just, in the living room, I look at her and go, are you sure you're telling me the truth? And she just rolled her eyes. 
That is exactly the way that we are with God. Is that when we're having the conversations with God, we're asking the questions and we're answering the questions for God. We don't allow God to even use anybody in our life to point us to something that would be using our life for greatness because what we do is that we want to look at the present. Oh my gosh, I've got to have that. I've got to have that guy. I've got to have that girl. I've got to have that job. I've got to have, I've got to have something. I've got to be in that relationship. I've got to have something. And yet people have told you and told you and even told the person you're dating, this is not a good thing. And I want you to know, you might not even say this, it is for God's greatness. Don't do this. Other people are telling them. And yet we don't listen because We've already decided what the greatness is. And when your greatness trumps God's greatness, all you'll get is mediocrity. Can I get an amen? You think about that. God's always used other people to call us out. And so the first element of being called out is determined by relationships. Look what it says in verse 47. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, Here truly is an Israelite. In whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathaniel asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathaniel declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. Jesus said, You believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. Now, wait a minute. I am looking at the Messiah that's been prophesied for over 400 years, and you're telling me now I'm going to see greater things than that? You're going to see greater things than that. He then added, very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Let me give you the second element of being called out. Second element of being called out by God is determined by his greatness. Nathaniel is wrestling with this. God's affirming his struggles. When Jesus says, there is nothing false in you. People who think they have it all together, they think they have no faults. People who wrestle with God, they're not faultless, they're false-less. And Jesus went and found Nathaniel. And Nathaniel's not searching for Jesus. Said, Boy, isn't that our story? You're not searching for God. God believed in your greatness before you ever found Christ. Before you ever even thought that might be a thought I have is that I need to surrender to Jesus. God already knew the greatness that you would bring and he wants to call that out in our life. And then Jesus says about Nathaniel, here is a true Israelite. Here was the problem. All the religious people hanging around, they deemed themselves as a true Israelite. They saw themselves more than everybody else. But Nathaniel knew where the name of Israel came from. He knew it came from his forefather by the name of Jacob. You see, back in that day, they didn't name their kids because of a college football team or some athlete or somebody off a Hallmark channel. They named them because it really meant something. So I, I don't have any idea how it happened. I don't know if when Jacob came out of the womb, his dad looked at him and went, oh, goodness, that boy's got deception all over him. His name is Jacob. It means deception. Can you imagine living with that all your life? Going to school? Did y'all hear Susie's lunch box? Her, her lunch got stolen out of her backpack? Well, you can bet it was Jacob. But I'll tell you this, don't even go try to find it. That dude's probably either ate it. He's discarded all the evidence. I mean, that joker is deceptive, and you'll never know it. He knew all that. And yet what happened was, was that he was so deceptive until there was a moment in Jacob's life. The scripture says he wrestled with God all night long. And he said to God, why wrestle with him? I will not let you go until you bless me. And he blessed him. There's a lot of people that say, well, Jacob, he was so tough. Man, he wrestled with God and he won. Seriously? You think God's going to lose a wrestling match? God ain't going to lose a wrestling match. And he, he didn't lose it with him. But you see, after he blessed him, he changed his name from Jacob to Israel. And then it came to the point. That 
God blessed him and changed his name. And then the scripture talks about the angels ascending and descending. It goes back to the dream that Jacob had in the book of Genesis. Where Jacob saw the ladder going to heaven and the angels ascending and descending. And so what God is telling Jacob, you know what? I know of your father Isaac. And I know of your grandfather Abraham. And I know how they were called out for greatness. And they were used by me because they chose to follow me. Jacob, your dad, your granddad might not have it. But that doesn't mean you've got it. You've got to choose for yourself if you want this kind of greatness. And so he's, he's telling Nathaniel, you can't, you can't, the reason he gave the illustration about the angels ascending and, des- and descending, he says, Nathaniel, you can't live without me. And so he's telling Nathaniel what he's telling us. I know your pain, I know your struggles, I know your doubts, I know what you're wrestling with. And yet God sees you, he loves you, he cares for us, he values you us and he knows the impossible things that we're dealing with and he says you can deal with these because of my greatness my greatness in you and he says trust me because I am the bridge for all of eternity I'm the bridge from heaven from from earth to heaven I'm the one who has bridged the gap and he wants his kingdom played out on earth well how do you do that well if you have a kingdom you gotta have a king everybody in here has a king your king might be athletics. Your king might be the relationship you're in. It might, be even, it might even be your parents. Your, your king might be something else. It might be some kind of substance abuse that you, that you will have an addiction because of that. Who knows what your king could be? Your king could be your marriage. Everybody, your kingdom, your king might be yourself. Everybody in here has a king. Well, because if you have a kingdom, you've got to have a king. And see what? This king by the name of Jesus does is that he takes the keys of of what's in our life, our bondage and our complacency and our destruction and our failures and our fears and even death and hell itself. And he takes the same keys and unlocks something in our life so that we can produce direction and fulfillment and joy and peace and passion and an eternity in a place called heaven. But God is calling you out today for greatness in your life. And it doesn't happen because you showed up. It doesn't happen because because your parents have it or your grandparents have it. It comes because you decided, either as a student or as a single adult, as a married adult, I am going to be called out for greatness in my life in a way that I've never been called out. So where does it start? It starts today by you saying, God, I don't really even understand all of it, but this is what I know. I need more than my greatness. And I need to be called out for greatness that you're calling me out for. And today you might, think, you might be thinking, I don't have anything to contribute. Good, that's a great place to start. Because usually it's proud people that never called out for greatness in the kingdom. It's people that are broken. We saw this happen when Sharon and I went on a cruise together. We went on a cruise and Cher booked all of our excursions. And so our first, uh, thank you, our first uh, stop was a place called Roatan in Honduras. And um, we got there and we were doing an excursion and we were going to see the mangroves. I'm, I don't have time to explain it. You can Google it and find out what the mangroves are. Real cool thing. But all of a sudden we show up and as we show up, there's a guy that we get to spot and there's a guy by the name of Kevin. And Kevin is there, and Kevin is, um, I keep hearing a phone go off. Is that me, or or am I hearing things? Oh, well. I've been gone for 10 weeks, I don't know. All right. So, anyway, we're we're going to this place, and we come to this stop, and we meet Kevin. And Kevin says, oh, you're going to the mangroves. He said, yes. There's just a regular car, and the only people in the car are Kevin and Phil and Cher. And the only thought I had was, this is going to be like the movie Taken. <laughs> We're fixing to be taken. And nobody's going to ever hear from us again. And so as we are going, we just begin to drum up a conversation, and we're talking about family, what we do for a living. And he begins to talk, and as we talk about family, we basically get around to faith. And I asked him, I said, well, tell me where you are on your journey of faith. He goes, well... I go to church. I said, what kind of church do you go to? He said, I go to an Assembly of God church. And I said, oh, good. And he said, yeah, my, my cousin Amos is the pastor. And I said, do you go a lot? And he goes, oh, I go every Sunday. My wife goes, I go, my kids go. He said, but 
I, I haven't taken that step yet. I haven't taken that step of faith yet. I said, why not? And he goes, I, I don't have any idea. And we continue to talk and about his faith and why he hasn't made that decision. And he said, well, you know, I, I think that I'll take that step of faith. I think I'll do that when I see that my wife's ready to do that. And Cheryl's sitting in the back seat and Cheryl says, oh, whatever you do, don't do that. I promise you, if you'll make this decision, your wife will come along. Don't do that. Don't wait on her. You lead, do what you're supposed to do. He said, I need to make that step of faith. But he said, I, I will tell you. He says, I haven't taken that step of faith. But he says, I do tithe. You tithe? He said, yeah. I said, why do you tithe? He said, well, Amos preaches about tithing. And if we'll give our first 10%, well, I got it figured is that God's got it all. And he said, he lets me have 90 and I give him 10. I figure that's a pretty good deal. And I said, really? And he said, yeah. He says, even my boss at my job, he tells me that before he became a follower of Jesus, he did the same thing. I said, he tithed before he ever gave his life to Jesus? And he goes, oh, yeah. And I said, what's that done for you? And he goes, never gone without. God's taken care of every need in my life. I never, ever, we've never struggled. We, we're not rich, but we've never struggled. God's always taken care of that, always. And I said, Bro, I need you to come preach at my church. And I said, you're the first guy I've ever met in my life that gave their money before they gave their life. He said, I said, why do you not give your life? He goes, I don't, I don't know. So we continue to talk, and as we're talking, we just continue to converse about faith and what's going on in faith. And Come here, Payne. And so we're sitting there, and we finally get right in front of the ship. And God just gave me this illustration. I said, Kevin, I'm going to tip you. I'm either going to give you this, or I'm going to give you this. Which do you want? So which would you take? Take it. Be sure and tie that. Thanks for helping me, all right? Hayden, help him. That's four dollars. Okay, that's forty. All right. He took the forty. Sheriff sitting in the back seat, and she says, "Kevin, God has so much more than forty dollars for you. He wants to give you so much more." And I says, "Kevin, can I tell you why you're not willing to step out in the greatness that God has for you?" He said, "Why?" And I said. <clears throat> because of pride, us men, we know that well. And I said, let me tell you what's happening. Is I said, the devil is getting for you to wait one more day. That's, that's, his, that's, his, big, that's, that's his greatest weapon. He gets you to wait, to procrastinate one day. Because if you wait a day, you'll wait a week, you'll wait a month, you'll wait a lifetime, and you'll eventually die without Jesus, and you'll go to a place called hell. He said, I don't want to go to hell. I said, you don't have to. But you've got to surrender your life to Jesus. And I said, Kevin, wouldn't you like to give your life to Jesus? And he looked at me and he said, I sure would. Right there in his car. We held hands and he prayed to receive Jesus right there in his car. And we sat there and we thought, what an incredible sabbatical that we would see a young man in Roatan pray to receive Jesus. Let me tell you, for some of you here today, God trying to tell you, I got a lot more than $40 for you. You think I'm about meeting just your financial needs? No, I'm, I'm, I'm calling you out for greatness. I'm calling you out for the kingdom. But you've got to choose that. Let me ask you to bow your head and close your eyes if you would. If you've never ever made that decision to give your life to Jesus, I want to give you that opportunity right now. I'm not here to embarrass you, but if you want to give your life to Jesus, you want to become a Christ follower, I'm going to pray a prayer out loud, and I'm going to ask that you would repeat that prayer silently after me. So if you want to do that, I'm going to pray now, and you repeat this prayer after me. Dear God, on this day, I give you my life. Jesus, thank you 
for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for taking my sins for me. Come into my heart. Save me on this day. And I'm willing to follow you. No one looking around, and I promise you I'm not going to embarrass you. But if you just prayed that prayer right then, I want you to do me a favor. I want you to lift your hand and put it back down, would you? Just lift it up and put it back down. God bless you. God bless you. Anybody else? If you lifted your hand, can I please encourage you to take a Connect card in the seat back in front of you, fill it out, and put it in the offering that passes by you. There's some of you here today. You're a Christ follower, but God's trying to call you out for greatness today. He's trying to call you out for something that you don't even understand. It starts by you just saying, God, I would choose the greatness that you have for me. Just start right there. You don't have to go any further than that. Just start right there. God, I pray that we would choose to decide to, uh, we would decide to be called out for the greatness that you have for our life. Thank you for the way that you care for us and that you love us. In Jesus' name that we pray and everybody says.